Hi, Lydia. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us and doing this uh, mini interview for our pedagogy class. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. So um, it's just a little bit about the class. This is a class mostly of undergraduates with one graduate student. They are all um, kind of younger pianists who are looking possibly into teaching or um, in incorporating aspects of teaching in their career. And we've been talking about various aspects of teaching, but of course, one of the most important aspects of teaching is the business side of things, um, figuring how to run a studio. And so I thought you would be a really great person to talk to because you do run a business and you do the business side of things for your studio very well. So I'll just jump right in with our very first question, which is, Tell us about your background and how you got to where you are today, successfully running a teaching studio in Orlando. Awesome. Um, before I jump into the story, thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I think that running a studio or running the business side of a studio is sometimes more daunting for the typical musician because it's not necessarily something that we take courses in or have a lot of background in before we're just like thrown into the, <laughs> the actual business world. So it's something I'm actually really passionate about. And I think it's one of the most practical um, life learning types of things that a musician, especially in an undergraduate or graduate program can learn. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, just a little bit about me, um, and I will kind of lump Ryan into this as well, because for those of you who don't know, my husband Ryan is also a music teacher, and we kind of co-teach together as part of the Blakemore School of Music, so um, both of us have our degrees in piano. Um, we did undergraduates at different schools. I did my undergraduate at Furman University, um, and my degree is in piano performance, and then my husband did his degree at Clearwater Christian College and his degree was I also think piano performance not 100 percent sure <laughs> um, but we ended up at FSU for our graduate studies which is where we met each other and met Dr. Lin um, and pursued our master's in piano at the same time I majored in piano performance he majored in performance pedagogy um, but both kind of knew at that point that we would most likely end up teaching um, pre-college, pre-collegiate st students mostly. Um, I would say from graduation until today, it's definitely been a journey and a learning experience. Um, I will say that we definitely were not perfect when we were trying to put together our business and learned a ton along the way. Um, had a lot of great people around us to kind of help guide us through some of the more businessy aspects of it. Um, and I'm excited to kind of share some more of that journey and kind of a few of the things that we've learned that hopefully will make anyone else's life easier as they go through and try to establish this. Um, just a bit about where we are today. Um, we teach through the Blakemore School of Music, which is our school that we've started. Um, we officially incorporated ourselves in 2015, and so have been the Blakemore School of Music for, I don't know, about six going on seven years. Um, before that, we were the Blakemore School, or the Blakemore Piano Studio, um, but once we wanted to do everything really officially, we chose the name Blakemore School of Music. Um, and right now we teach about 60 to 65 students, um, some in person, some virtually, um, and we teach all over Central Florida. People drive in from as far away as Tampa to us, which is about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, and then virtually we reach students in the state of Florida and several other states, interestingly, which is one of the beautiful things about virtual lessons. Um, I would say, I would say I'll leave it there because I'll probably talk a little bit more about us and specifically the business side of things as we go. Um, but yeah, yeah, does that kind of give you a good snapshot of where we are right now? 
Sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. It, it's a great uh, background to um, kind of leap off from. So um, you briefly mentioned this, you know, one of the challenges about running a business is the fact that a lot of times in our schooling, we don't actually learn much about business, you know, we're so focused on practicing and learning repertoire and preparing for a recital, writing papers, but really we don't learn about um, taxes or incorporation, you, you kind of mentioned that, really have no idea what that means. So I'd like to for us to get into that a little more. But before we do, do you have any general advice for um, young musicians and pianists who do kind of find themselves in that situation? You know, they're looking at their coursework and thinking, oh, no, I don't have any classes on how, pre how to prepare a tax form or how to run a business, how to register my business. What's some of your advice for these young musicians? Um, well, the really beautiful thing about all of this is you don't actually need to understand taxes and business law and all of these things in order to run your own business. Um, we, my husband and I, are huge proponents of hiring professionals to do those kinds of things for you, because I would say, and I would strongly recommend that, especially if you'd like to grow your business into something a little bit more than, hey, I'm gonna teach a couple lessons a week, just as a way to supplement my other job, you know, just as a hobby. If you're going to make this your livelihood, I would strongly encourage you to hire the professionals necessary to not only set up your business properly, but to help you maintain your business properly. Um, and I would say your number one ally in doing that is going to be your CPA um, and your CPA is going to really, really help you understand what kinds of things you need to keep records of during the year, how you can most efficiently and effectively file for your taxes and they do it for you. <laughs> so you don't actually have to stress out too, too much about doing as, lo as long as you're keeping good records, you don't have to stress out about filing things and understanding all of the nuances of the tax code or anything like that yourself. Um, and I kind of compare it to, you know, we go to school for our degree and we would like to be considered professionals and we don't necessarily want the future generations of American young children to be learning how to play the piano off of YouTube or from someone who may have had lessons for two years in middle school and kind of remembers how to read notes. Like we would rather them come to us, the professionals who have spent lots and lots of time and lots and lots of money and countless, you know, hours of preparation to get to this point, right? So in the same way, I am not a qualified tax <laughs> professional, so I'm happy to pass that off to someone who is. I guess that would be my basic advice. At the same time, it does not hurt at all to make yourself aware of kind of the basic structures of how to be a small business owner or things like that. And there are so many different resources and materials available to you, not just specific to musicians, but um, so many things where you can learn the basics of what are the different types of corporations and why would you become one over another. Um, so as you are interested, go for it, you know, learn what you would like, but don't feel like you can't make it <laughs> if you are not an expert, because we're not needed to be experts. Great, that's a really wonderful perspective and um, a way of thinking about it. So I, I want to jump down to that question that I had prepared, uh, maybe question five about um, registering your business and the uh, accountant. How did you find an accountant? What are the qualities that you look for? Um, and did you have to go through several accountants or did you luck out and just found the perfect fit with the first one? So I will say there are kind of two aspects to setting up your business that I think are really important. And one is the financial aspect and it kind of goes hand in hand. Like when you're setting up your business for the first time, you want to make sure you do it properly. You want to make sure you do it legally and you want to make sure you choose the right type of business entity, right? Like, should I be an LLC? Should I be an S corporation? What do those things mean? And which ones can offer you not only the most 
advantages as far as taxes go, but also the most protections legally, because for a lot of us, um, we are most likely going to be using our homes for our businesses. Um, and we are dealing with minors. <laughs> and all of these things require a little bit of extra legal protection. Um, and so I would say talk to a lawyer about how to set that up because each state has slightly different legal precedents. Um, for example, I feel like in most states, an LLC is a really popular structure for a small business. Um, and it's probably the one that's most highly recommended for um, a music studio or a music school. However, I don't know if any of you are planning on teaching Florida later on, but apparently there is some kind of legal precedent in the state of Florida to where that was not the most protective business structure. So my business is actually just an S corporation. Um, and the reason was is because we're using our home as part of our business. And so because of that, our lawyer recommended that we become an S corporation instead of an LLC, which is not something that I would have known just based on research, because I'm not totally knowledgeable in all of the most recent cases <laughs> that set precedent in Florida law. So I would encourage you to talk to a lawyer, um, probably just a small business lawyer would be fine, but somewhere where, or someone who practices in your state maybe even specifically in your county that you would like to teach in in the future. And that will probably give you the most accurate and specific advice to your situation. Um, and then as far as the CPA goes, we really lucked out and were able to find <laughs> our CPA um, right away on the recommendation of another music teacher. So um, a great piece of advice is if you know of an established teacher in the place where you plan on teaching, um, why not ask if they already use a CPA and or a lawyer who is probably at that point pretty familiar with the type of structure that you're most likely going to be using and can probably be really helpful to you, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, you talked earlier about your accountant asking you to keep certain records. Can you give us an example of what type of records you to keep? Correct. So um, because of our business structure and because I think almost any business structure, regardless of which state you live in and what particular entity you choose, um, because you're going to be claiming expenses, you're going to need to keep expense records. So pretty much anything that you spend for your business or for the purpose of your business, whether or not that's like actually paying some of with your, your withholding tax or whether it's uh, purchasing a subscription to a music software so you can keep all of your students' records in a certain place, or whether you buy music for your school or for your students, you know, that all counts. Um, things like conferences, or we consider things like, you know, professional dues or professional development, that's all part of our business expenses. Uh, we keep spreadsheets of all of that, and I typically update that once a month, just so it's not a little bit overwhelming when it comes time to turn everything in for taxes. Um, and then as far as the IRS is concerned, you just have to kind of keep records of all of that for seven years. Uh, so in addition to keeping all of our spreadsheets, we also keep all of our hard receipts in a bunch of folders, just in case you never know. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm very thankful for filing with the CPA is they're able to claim so many things as expenses and i feel like that offers you a level of protection because the irs knows that a professional is the one who is deciding whether or not it's able to be considered an expense like we even claim part of our home as our business so that's uh, a home deduction you can consider a portion of your utilities you can consider a portion of your internet expenses as a business expense and so they factor all of that together and decide which portion of that we can write off on taxes, which is beautiful. And um, if I remember correctly, you can also include your instruments, right? And the, the valuation of your instruments, is that part of it? Correct. And so what you can do, there are two ways to do that. And I am not an expert on this by any means, but that's why I have a CPA. 
Um, you can either claim it annually for a certain number of years, or you can claim depreciation all at one time. Um, and so depending on what your CPA would advise, um, you can do one or the other, but yes. Okay. Awesome. I want to just take one step back because we've been talking about claiming expenses and I'm yes. not completely sure um, how many of my students have filed taxes in the past and understand sure. the impact of claiming an expense is on a company's bottom line and how much taxes they okay. So can you walk us through that? Yes. So one of the fantastic things about how our business is structured is that we pay ourselves through our business. So we receive a paycheck from BSM every month, just as if we were employees. Um, and our CPA has kind of calculated a fair wage, so to speak. And so regardless of how much money we bring in, regardless of how many hours we teach, we always take the same amount each month, kind of as a wage. Um, that's considered part of our business expenses. So we don't have to pay taxes on that if that makes sense. That's part of the expenses of the business. In addition to that, all of the other things that we actually have to spend money on in order to run our business, like even things like filing a corporate fee with the state of Florida so that we can continue being a business every year, that's 150 bucks. <laughs> we file it every year, that's considered a business expense, right? If we have to rent a venue to give a recital for our students, that's considered a business expense. And so all of these things, offset our profit. Let's say for the sake of being very simple, we make $100,000 in a year. Let's say that $40,000 of that is expenses, either payroll for us or expenses for whatever reason. So that means that our profit is $60,000. Because we're set up like an S corporation, Ryan and I are both the shareholders of our business, which means that the rest of that money is just our money in shares, if that makes sense. And that's a lot friendlier for tax purposes because you get taxed much less on that. And if I was a CPA, I could explain that a little bit better. <laughs> but um, depending on your particular situation, I'm sure that your future CPA will be able to help you figure out exactly which where is the sweet spot of your business, your future business, to where you can be the most profitable, if that makes sense. Does that help? Yeah, that's that's super. Um, I want to step away from this topic a little bit and ask a little about zoning, because that's an area that I'm not quite clear on. So you do teach out of your home, which is, which is residential, and some Correct. people you rent commercial spaces to run a studio, but you don't do that. Is there anything special that you have to do to, in order to gain permission in order to teach out of your home? That is entirely dependent on the city that you live in or that you want to live in. And that is entirely dependent on your homeowners association <laughs> of said city. Um, we have an HOA in our little neighborhood and they are really kind and really flexible and so far have given us no trouble however um i know more now than i did when i moved into this neighborhood and i do believe that if i was ever to move and if i ever wanted to move with the intention of continuing to teach out of my house i would need to do a huge amount of research into the future hoa before I would feel comfortable doing that because I do know several teachers who have tried to teach out of their home and who have literally had to move because their HOA just gave them so many problems. Um, either because there were too many cars parked in front of their house or if there was like people complaining about noise or I don't know, different HOAs have varying levels of strictness when it comes to this. Um, I'm very fortunate that our HOA is very flexible and very casual about things like this. So we haven't had any problems, but that's definitely something to be aware of. Um, and then as far as city ordinances, I am also very lucky in that regard because we live in a teeny, tiny, tiny part of unincorporated 
winter springs, which means that we don't have a city to answer to specifically. Um, I do believe that if you have a city, like if you're within a city jurisdiction, you would have to kind of make sure that you're okay as far as zoning goes. And not, not that it's impossible to do it, but if someone were to ever complain, that would be the end, you know? So it's a little bit of a risk. Um, I know people do it, <laughs> you know? And I think in this day and age, teaching from home and working from home in general is becoming a lot more acceptable. So I don't know that it's the kind of thing that would be enforced 100% of the time, but it's definitely something that you should look into before you buy your dream home. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um in terms of the recruiting aspect, I'm assuming that you moved to Orlando and the students didn't all come at once, um, that you had to gradually build up your reputation. How did you do that? Um, some of it was by accident and students just kind of fell into our lap through a variety of reasons. And a lot of it was kind of networking and participating in events where people start noticing that you have a presence, you know, if you have students in this, you have students in this, and, you know, everyone's friends with everyone. And so if your students like you, they tend to bring their friends at some point. So I would say in recent years, we've grown a lot through word of mouth. At the beginning, um, our story is a bit interesting where uh, within the span of about a year or two, there were several teachers that either moved states, went on maternity leave, never to come back or not planning to come back or a school closed. And because of that, we were very blessed to inherit a whole bunch of students. Um, and that definitely gave us a bit of a kickstart that I think, you know, you can't expect that necessarily, but um, I don't know. There are always people moving on, people retiring, people, you know, deciding to scale back. And so I would say networking is definitely a wonderful thing to do. Um, and a lot of times if there are teachers who are looking to move or looking to retire and they know that a young eager teacher has just moved into town, like, you are a great option for someone to, you know, pass off students to, or if there is a teacher who's full and can't take anyone, you know, it's great to have connections like that to help you kind of build your studio, especially in the early days when you're looking to get established, I would say. I think anytime we embark on a um, new aspect of our career, there are always unexpected challenges that show up that we cannot anticipate. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges of, of running a teaching studio that maybe you didn't realize would come your way? And is there anything that you would do differently if you could do it all over again? That's a good question. I think that some of our challenges are not specific to us, but kind of specific to everyone. <laughs> um, and I guess one of the unfortunate things is I don't know if we could change anything. Like, okay, some of the challenges that we face, which I think almost any teacher trying to have a private studio would face is, you know, you end up teaching long hours late into the evening. <laughs> um, and if you are like us, you will most likely not just have long hours late into the evening, but you will also have long days <laughs> leading into long hours late into the evening, which is fairly exhausting during the school year, I will say. Um, and if I'm honest, I don't exactly know how to avoid that, especially if you don't really want to fire half of your students or take a huge pay cut or anything like that. And so I don't know if that's completely avoidable, um, but that is definitely, I think, one of the things that you know going into it, but is also challenging, especially as you continue. Um, so I think building in times where you just don't teach is important just for sanity's sake. 
Um, In-home teaching is also a struggle. Um, we are not currently in-home teaching, but um, in the past, my husband Ryan has done at least two days a week of in-home teaching. And of course, that is really tiring in a whole different way um, because you have to deal with traffic and you have to deal with lots of different people's houses and you know, whatever environmental distractions are you know there and so that that's a whole different thing um, and we're considering bringing that back a little bit because one of the things that we've realized is no matter how much you dislike it <laughs> and no matter how expensive you make it there are always people who will prefer to pay you whatever amount of money for you to go teach conveniently in their house. And for better or for worse, seeing people in person, at least periodically, is better educationally for the student. And so we're considering bringing back a little bit of in-home teaching, um, even though it's probably not the most personally easy thing to do, you know the students. <laughs> um, so those are a couple of different challenges. But like I said, I don't think that there is necessarily a magical solution to avoid that unless you are a super creative online teacher and can teach people in different time zones. You know, so I think that's a hazard of the business, so to speak. So you talked about at the very beginning that you have approximately 60 to 65 students right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and to me, that sounds like a full studio, like a full load. So what are your goals for the future? What do you see for yourself in the next five years, 10 years, even in 20 years um, towards the latter end of your career? That's a good question. A lot of people always ask us if we're planning on expanding the business or, you know, expanding to a commercial space, hiring other teachers. We've kind of played around with that idea from time to time, and we're not 100% opposed to it, but right now we don't exactly see that as where we're headed. Um, I think we feel that we don't want to just be business owners, we actually want to teach, and we're a little bit afraid that if we took that route, we would end up being a little bit more of administrators and a little bit less of teachers, if that makes sense. And so right now that doesn't 100% appeal to us. Um, I would say things that we are hoping to do in the future, other than continue to improve the quality of what we're able to offer, is um, potentially do a little bit more by way of um, providing other teachers with materials and trying to work on projects that can allow for more passive income. Because, I mean, if you're working a million hours a day, you probably can't sustain that indefinitely. Um, and so uh, Ryan has been doing a lot of projects um, virtually um, through YouTube and through some course sites to try to work through that. And um, I've been working through the last couple of years to develop some musicianship course curriculum that was supposed to be designed exclusively for our students. But as I worked through it, I kind of see that it might actually be something that other students and other teachers and private studios may enjoy taking advantage of because it's curriculum designed to teach students about, you know, composers, about world music, about different musical forms and things like that. And there are worksheets that go along with it. And so depending on when I have time, I'd like to kind of edit it a little bit and then perhaps make it available to anyone who might be interested. So those are some things that we see perhaps doing more of in the future or as a way to grow in the future without being able to grow more hours to teach more students. <laughs> um, I would also like to see us in a little bit more of a mentoring role to other young business owners. Great. Um, so that was all the questions that I had. Um, really appreciated your insights. Um, is there anything else that I haven't asked that I should have asked? I don't think so. I would say to any young teacher who is trying to get started, the more you teach, the better you get. 
like honestly. So teach anyone and everyone you can <laughs> for the first couple of years, um, because the more you do it, you really do get better and you figure out what you enjoy teaching. One of the things that I also like to tell people is that not everyone, okay, let's rephrase. No one is good at everything, right? And so knowing what you enjoy doing and knowing what you're good at doing will help you become a better teacher because you will focus in on the types of things that you excel at and you will attract the type of students that want that thing. Um, and so, especially now when you're in school, teach as much as you possibly can so you can start figuring that out. And that way, when you want to take your big step out into the real world, you'll have an idea of what kinds of things you feel like you can bring. And that will help you differentiate yourself from however many other teachers are already teaching in your future market. Um, and I think that's been something that's really helped us um, in the greater Orlando market because, I mean, I wouldn't say there's a saturation of teachers here, but there's definitely a lot. Um, and I think that we definitely offer something quite different than almost anyone else. And I think that has worked to our advantage. Um, and the other thing I would say is have the most informative professional website you possibly can have because that will save you so much time in weeding out students who aren't the perfect fit for you in your future. I know that there are lots of schools of thought out there that say, you know, oh, just make them interested. Don't put everything on the website. Let them call you. Um, I would disagree with that only because as a consumer, I want to know exactly what I'm calling for before I take the trouble to call for it. So we elect to put all of our fees online, all of our policies are online, our entire calendar is online, everything is online. That way, anyone who contacts us, hopefully will know exactly what they're getting into. So when we interview them, they understand what they are signing up for, if that makes sense. Those yeah. are just a couple of things. Absolutely. I find that to be um, really um, insightful advice. And I, I totally agree. I, I think that, you know, you talked about as a consumer really wanting to know that price upfront. Um, you know, right now I'm a homeowner and occasionally I want to work on projects on the house and I go to all these websites and they don't have any pricing or reference available. And it feels a little like they're trying to like rope me in and get me hooked. Um, and then suddenly I owe them so much money um, really without knowing what I'm stepping into. So I mm -hmm. really agree with that philosophy, laying everything out so that everyone is on the same page and no one feels deceived, stepping mm -hmm. into that kind of relationship with the teacher. Oh yeah. Um, and one last thing, don't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> everyone else there has already made policies and a business plan and has a website. So find someone who you like or someone who you think is doing well or doing something similar to what you would like to do and have them mentor you. I'm sure that almost every single teacher out there would love to help someone get started, you know, um, and several teachers like I <laughs> already have all my stuff online. So, you know, great. I don't think it's a bad thing to, yeah. you know, um, I, I think maybe that's a fantastic way to end. Can you tell my students and those who are watching how they can reach you or find your website? What's your website's address? Sure. Um, our website is Um And you can reach us at BlakemoreSchoolOfMusic at gmail.com. We are happy to answer any questions um, and are happy to help you with any I don't know, business ideas or <laughs> plans that you might have as you get started in the real world. But wish you all the luck and happy teaching. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time, Lydia. Thank you for your insights. And thank you for offering um, your service and your um, input um, for future teachers and, and that passion that you have for mentoring younger teachers. So that's all. That's all the time we have for today. Um, really appreciate it. And maybe we can do it again next time when we have another topic that we need to call on your expertise for. Sounds great. Thank you. Great. Bye. Bye.